Welcome to today's webinar, Nike for All, using high quality data to ensure students are on track for success. I am Nevesha Noble, an associate of Alliance Engagement at America's Promise Alliance. For, for nearly 30 years, the nation's graduation rate was stuck at just over 70%. But over the past dozen years, the nation has seen remarkable gains. Graduation rates have climbed more than 10 percentage points, reaching an all-time high of 83.2% in 2015. Over the past two years, however, the pace of increase has slowed, putting the goal of a 90% high school graduation rate by 2020 at risk. We are determined to meet the goal, and we know the use of high-quality data to monitor cohort progress, identify struggling students, and form effective responses and provide accountability is critical to state and local efforts to improve graduation outcomes. For today's webinar, America's Promise Alliance is joined by experts Brennan, Brennan Tom Parton, Associate Director for the State Policy and Advocacy at the Data Quality Campaign, and Jenny Nagoga, Deputy Director at the University of Chicago Consortium on School Research, who will provide us with critical insights during the first part of today's webinar. Brennan will share the Data Quality Campaign's four policy priorities to make data work for students, and Jenny will provide an overview of the to and through projects freshman on track toolkit a model used to provide schools or districts with valuable information on how to develop educator teams that are focused on research, data, and successful practices to help freshmen reach the finish line. The second half of the Grad Nation webinar will delve more deeply into Minnesota's focus on the effective use of data to improve graduation rates. Minnesota's grad rates continue to trend upward, with the class of 2016 posting the overall highest rate on record at 82.2%, and importantly, the state remains focused on closing gaps for key student groups. Today, we will hear from a panel of Minnesota stakeholders engaged in efforts to improve the state's data policies and practices. Cammie Lair, Grad Minnesota Project Manager for the Minnesota Alliance with Youth. John Gimple, Implementation Specialist at the Minnesota Department of Education. Jackie Blogsved, School Improvement Program Specialist at the Minnesota Department of Education, and Melanie Wellnitz, Director of the Southwest Prairie Regional Center for Excellence. To get us started, I'll turn things over to Brennan from our national partner organization, the Data Quality Campaign. Great. Thank you so much, Navisha. I am so thrilled to be on and to to kick off a webinar talking about the value of high quality data to meet goals for students. Um, and at DQC, we find this to be incredibly important. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Data Quality Campaign, we're an organization that believes in the power of data. And we have this big idea, although we don't want it to just be our big idea, that when students, when parents, when educators, when partners, have the right information to make decisions students excel. Um, and it's really this student-centered vision of, of the conversations and the, the questions and the actions that we need to take informed by data to help every student, uh, which is perfect to talk about, perfect to tee up a conversation about 90 for all or every student. Um, and we have what, what we think is a policy roadmap that can help every state get to that vision, every state make it possible for, for all those closest to students to, to have the data that they need. And we've developed what are called the four policy priorities to make data work for students. And if you think about it, just four priorities, that's it. It's pretty simple. You have to measure what matters. You have to make data use possible. You have to be transparent and earn trust. And you have to guarantee access and protect privacy. Now, I know that the work that goes into each of these, making sure you have the right data that answers your questions, making sure that teachers, that educators have the training and support they need, putting out data to the public that informs conversations, even when that data doesn't paint the prettiest picture, and making sure that those closest to students have the individual data that they need to have conversations and inform action on behalf of kids. That's big work, and it's not one and done work. But if you keep those four priorities in mind, we know that everyone will have the information they need. And I want to hone in particularly on this concept for today about being transparent and earning trust, which is about putting out the information that people need to be able to make decisions about their own child's education, about the schools in their community or in their state. Um, and that takes courage, actually, to be able to put out that information, like I said, especially if it doesn't paint the prettiest picture. 
And that's compounded sometimes because there can be skepticism about the reliability of data, and certainty about how data can and should be used. We see this if you if you're someone who's been in conversations with grad rate graduate about graduation rates, for example, at the national or the local level, you hear the skepticism about what goes into this number. How do I know that this growth over one or two years is real? Is is something? Is this a number that I can trust? Um, and we really believe that states, that leaders at all levels, and and us at the Data Quality Campaign um, have a responsibility to help people understand what goes into making that number. Um, because the trust in the information and believing that it's something you can use and act on is so important. Um, and while there is skepticism out there, there are also some great bright spots of, of states and, and districts, and I'm sure many on the webinar know even classrooms, that are putting data to use to, to help kids, to help lots of students succeed. And there's three that I want to point out today. Uh, one, Georgia, a state that we at DQC talk about a lot, um, has seen improvements across academic performance over the past few years, including a seven percentage point increase in its graduation rate since 2012. Data is no panacea, it's not the silver bullet, but leaders, and certainly us at DQC, attribute um, a culture of data use and access to data uh, to, to part of the reason that they've seen those gains and those growths. Another one, Kentucky, between 2012 and 2014, saw a 15 percentage point increase in its college and career readiness rate, so kids being on track to go on for, for the next thing after high school. And again, really attributing that intentional focus on using data to support students as a key factor uh, in success. And finally, and perfectly teeing up the next speaker, a story that we love to tell about Chicago Public Schools. Um, that between 20, 2007 and 2014, the rate of students on track to graduate in Chicago rose from 57 to 84%. It's so easy to talk about percentage points, but what that number really means is 7,000 additional students who may not have made it between their freshman year and their senior year were now on track to do so. Um, and that is the power of data, is how not just how it moves percentage points, but helps individual students make progress, make change. Uh, and with that, I'm glad to turn it over to Jenny to talk about this in more depth. Great. Thank you so much, Brennan. It's a perfect key up for um, the next part. So I'm really excited to be here today because it gives me the chance to um, talk about the story of what we've been doing, um, what we've seen in Chicago, both the work um, of my organization, the Consortium on School Research, um, and the To and Through Project of which the consortium is a part. And I'll be talking to you a little bit about, um, provide you a little bit of an overview of that project and how um, it really has been a way that we're trying to help guide the district to continue to see the sorts of improvements that we've seen um, with the on track um, story as well as with high school graduation rates. Um, from there, I'm going to be going into a little bit more detail about um, the characteristics of effective indicators. And I'll be doing this um, to be telling you the story of the development of the freshman on track indicator and also talking about the progress that has been made and trying to distill some of the key lessons um, that we've learned about it so you can start to think about the role that indicators play um, in high quality data. So to give you a quick background on, um, on the consortium, We've been around since 1990. Um, we conduct place-based research focusing on the Chicago Public Schools. We really see ourselves as this thoughtful partner and at times a critical partner of, of the district. And what we try to do is not to be there to tell them what the right answer is for the struggles that urban school districts face, but really to be helping to build their capacity um, to be improving student outcomes. And so our research is really grounded in this idea that we are there to help guide the district, help them think about problems more effectively, and thinking about key leverage points that they might have. So we start with this idea that we're conducting basic research, which is really rooted in problems of practice. So our research is not there just to be in academic journals. So we're really trying to think about what are the day-to-day -day issues that the district is facing in terms of practice, in terms of policy? How can we be thinking about what sorts of research questions and research evidence are really needed to be helping schools be more effective? Um, so a lot of this is really thinking about, you know, what is the problem? Not that we have the right answer, that this is the right program to be taking, or this is the right approach, 
but making sure that we have a clear understanding of the nature of the problem when we're starting with it. And I'll talk a little bit more uh, about how that applies to the question around high school graduation um, and the freshman on track indicator. Um, and finally, a key part of our work is around indicator development. Um, it's really important that if we're going to be um, working to improve what's happening within schools, that we have an indicator that helps us both define what the problem is and having a way to assess the progress um, that's happening within the district and within schools. So the consortium has been this research part. And we've obviously um, spent a lot of time um, developing data, um, using data, and we've also spent a lot of our efforts in providing um, data to schools. But um, through the Two and Through project, it's really given us the opportunity to partner more closely um, with another organization at the University of Chicago who's been a close partner of ours over the past 10 plus years, the Network for College Success. And so the Network for College Success has acted as a translator of, of the research that the consortium has had and has really been providing um, schools um, in Chicago with the means of engaging in the research evidence out there, building their capacity to understand and use data, and most importantly, providing time for them to really be thinking about what is what does the research evidence tell them about what might be effective in their schools, and using data to really define what's happening there so that they know that the efforts that they're doing are actually being focused on key issues within their schools and providing the training for that. And so the Network for College Success is currently um, providing quarterly institutes to all the high schools um, in the Chicago Public Schools and is really filling in that critical gap of making sure um, that schools are able to use the data that is being provided to them. Okay. Oops, I'm trouble. There we go. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how indicators can be used. This is kind of a key part as we think about the role that high quality data plays. Um, so one of the first things that indicators um, can do for schools and for the district and for all of us who are thinking about education is that when we measure something, it really helps to clarify um, what the problem is and sort of help us point up to define what the, key, the priority issues that we're trying to be working on um, within schools. Um, secondly, um, in, when we have data that um, um, the indicator helps us identify which students and which schools are in need of support, so we can assess where um, schools stand and where students stand and where we want to be um, focusing our efforts. So this is both within specific students and also within subgroups of students. Um, indicators are also really um, helpful and helping us think about what are the sorts of strategies that we need, what are the key leverage points, and then be evaluating our progress on those strategies over time. Um, indicators also provide a really important signal to school practitioners about what priorities are. So um, people talk a lot about um, what measure, what, what's measured matters, and so this is one of the ways um, that we can really help be driving improvement because it, it helps to indicate what we think actually matters. Um, and finally, it also provides an important signal to students and their families um, about how students are performing and also the progress that their schools are making. So I'm going to take a quick step back um, and talk a little bit about the freshman on track indicator. So Brennan um, made a reference to it. So um, what is it? Um, the freshman on track indicator is it's a way of measuring whether or not a student at the end of um, at the end of ninth grade is um, on track to graduate, which is defined as having at least five credits by the end of the year. So in the Chicago public school context, um, that is the number of credits that is required to be promoted to to be a sophomore, and also having no more than one semester F in a core class. Um, so this indicator was initially developed in response um, to some earlier research that had happened at the consortium where we were really seeing um, the importance of, of the freshman year. So there are students 
who had been doing well in eighth grade, but when they reached high school, um, the story changed a lot for them, and they were starting their attendance drop, they were failing, and it really looked like students were on the path to actually not um, ultimately completing high school. Um, and we were asked by elementary schools and the Gear Up program to come up with a way of measuring um, student progress um, early on in high school. And we realized that from our research, we could actually be thinking about the number of failures that a student had as a key indicator um, that would give us an early sign of whether or not a student was um, on track to graduation. So why is this important? Um, we also did some research um, because we realized that you know we we sort of had earlier research which showed us how um, failure and attendance really mattered, um, but we actually wanted to be a little bit more precise about how predictive freshman on track is of whether or not students ultimately graduated. Um, and it turns out that a student who is on track at the end of the end of ninth grade is almost four times as likely to graduate than a student who was off track. Um, and most importantly, um, the freshman on track indicator is more predictive um, than other characteristics of students when they're coming into high school. So it's more predictive um, than poverty, it's more predictive than um, eighth grade test scores, it's more predictive um, than gender and race and ethnicity, and it's more predictive than all of those things combined. So I, so the freshman on track indicator really gives us a strong sense of what is likely to happen above and beyond all of these other things. Um, and one of the things that also made us think about is the fact that whether or not a student graduates from high school is not just the characteristics of a kid or where they come from or all these other um, barriers that students may have to being um, to graduating from high school that high school graduation rates are something that are much more within the locus of control of schools. That if schools can organize themselves to really support students, particularly in that immediate transition into high school, there's a lot that we can potentially do um, to support students to make sure that they're passing their classes, to make sure that they're coming to school and going to their, each of their classes, and really guiding them toward high school graduation. So what is it, how does this help us think about what an effective indicator is? Um, one of the important things um, about an indicator is that it has to reflect the priorities of both district leadership and the school staff, students, and their families. And one of the things about um, graduating from high school is something that everybody cares about. Um, so the freshman on track indicator actually started being a part of the accountability system in Chicago pretty early on. It was like about, in about um, 2003. And so from an early stage of after the development of the on track indicator, um, there's a signal that graduating from high school and being on track at the end of freshman year was something that the district cared deeply about. Um, it's also really important that an indicator is predictive of the outcome of interest. And so what I just showed you before is this relationship between being um, on track at the end of freshman year and graduating from high school. So you want to be sure um, that there's a clear um, relationship between the two and um, being on track at the end of freshman year gives us um, a much better prediction of who is likely to graduate than all other um, characteristics of that student. It's also really important um, that an indicator is providing information on something that school practitioners um, can do something about and actually have an impact on. So we talk about a lot about this as being as freshman and track as being malleable and it's also actionable. Um, so one of the things about um, um, for, uh, making sure that students pass their classes that are coming to class is that this this changes um, high school graduation into something that we can actually do something about um, inside of a high school. Um, when we think about high school graduation as being caused by external factors, which was how we thought about high school graduation 15, 20 years ago, um, where we thought that high school graduation was caused by um, 
things like um, really important serious issues like gang involvement and involvement in the juvenile justice system, you know, teenage pregnancy, all of these other things that we really thought were causing students to drop out. And it's not to say that those things don't matter, um, but if we actually focus on the, the more typical experience of students that are coming into high school, we can actually um, shape whether or not they're graduating um, from high school and that um, if we focus on understanding why it is that kids are not coming to class, you know, are they not coming to class because, um, is it because it's the first period of class and they're having trouble getting to school on time, um, or is it something else? Um, you know, are kids not passing their classes because they don't understand algebra, or is it, is it an attendance issue? Is it, is it something else? And so it's really reshaping how we think about um, the issue around around high school graduation. Um, it's also really important that the data um, that that is being provided around the indicator is available at the right time for practitioners to act. And so, for measuring it, it has to be it can't just be data that's happening you know once a year or every two years. Um, the thing about freshman on track, even though it's a measure of what's happening at the end of the year. Um, Practitioners can be monitoring whether or not students are coming to class, or how are they performing in, across all of their classes, in a way that really helps them um, shape what's happening and provide the support for students when it's needed. Um, it's also really important that um, the indicator is based on um, evidence where there's actually a um, direct causal linkage to the outcome of interest. And so what this is really just a fancy way of saying is that if we work on freshmen on track and we get more students to be on track, are we actually going to then see improvements in high school graduation? And as I'll be showing you in just a minute, um, in the Chicago public schools and in specific schools, when they improved um, their on track rates, they, they saw a um, similar increase in their high school graduation rate. So we actually do see that there appears to be a linkage between the two. Okay, so when we look at um, the trends in um, on track rates over time, if we go way back to 1999 and look at ninth graders then, um, there was an on track rate of just 57%. Um, and I actually one more year data than Brenda did, and we're now up to 85%. Or actually, by 2015, on track rates had gone up to 85%. So we're seeing almost a 30 percentage point increase in on track rates, which is a remarkable improvement over time. Sorry, I'm having trouble getting the slide. Please. Sorry, I'm having trouble here. Oh, can you get it back up for me? I'm sorry about that. So what we see when the slide comes back up, thank you. I'm having oh. So what we see when we look at the graduation rate that there that it parallels what the on track rate looks like um, over time. So we're still, um, so right now the high school graduation rate is at 74%. Um, and, um, and that it has, that as the on track rates went up, we saw the similar increase in high school graduation rate. Um, and I also want to thank you. I also wanted to point out two key points. So in 2003, was when the on-track indicator started being included on the Chicago Public Schools Accountability System. And at that point in time, um, at that point in time, um, the on-track rate was around 59%. And so, um, and so um, the years after that, um, we actually did not see an increase um, in the on-track rate. So even though it was an important signal to schools that um, 
freshman on track and high school graduation was something of importance, it wasn't enough to actually spur a change. And so it wasn't until um, 2009 um, when the district developed one of the first early warning systems with providing data to schools and also um, the Gates Foundation developed, um, had um, five high schools, which they had what they referred to as on-track labs, which were really helping to develop, and it was also around the same time that the Network for College Success started um, working closely with schools around freshmen on track, that we saw an increase in on-track rates. So this really helps us start to think that even though um, accountability is an important lever to provide a key signal to schools, um, at least in Chicago, where we really started to see improvements was when data was being provided to schools, if they were being provided with the support needed to be able to use that data, that they could engage with it, that it could actually have an impact on their day-to-day -day interactions with schools. And so um, what Freshman on Track story really tells us is that through data, we can actually see significant changes in high school graduation rates. And so now, Chicago is seeing thousands more students graduating every single year. Um, and from here, um, I am going to turn it over to Rachel. And thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much for providing such helpful insights and a model we can all learn from, Jenny. And thank you so much for, for your remarks as well, Brennan, at the top of the call. Um, I'm Rachel Tutwell of Fortune, and I serve as Senior Director of Alliance Engagement at America's Promise Alliance. Um, and I'm thrilled to moderate the second half of our webinar, which includes a panel discussion with our Minnesota colleagues and then a Q&A portion, giving us an opportunity to address some questions from the audience. As our Minnesota colleagues turn on their webcams for the panel discussion, I'd like to take a moment to encourage you to submit any questions you have from the earlier presentations via the questions panel. America's Promise Alliance is pleased to have this state panel as a part of today's webinar as Minnesota is one of the states participating in our Grad Nation State Activation Initiative through which we support statewide innovation and collaboration to improve graduation rates in partnership with Pearson. The Minnesota Alliance with Youth, represented today by Cami Lair, the project manager for the Grad Minnesota campaign, is our state grantee and works in partnership with the Minnesota Department of Education, the Governor's Office, and many others on efforts to improve graduation outcomes. Now that we can see our full panel, uh, you can see that in addition to Cami at the Minnesota Alliance, we are joined by John and Jackie from the Minnesota Department of Education, and Melanie from the Southwest Prairie Regional Center of Excellence. Thank you all so much for joining us today. And to kick us off, I'm going to ask Kimmy to just describe uh, how Minnesota has prioritized the issue of high quality data. Thank you, Rachel. I'm really pleased that you invited Minnesota to share our story today. Um, I'm really proud to say that Minnesota has a strong history of recognizing the important role that data plays in driving decision making to impact student performance. We have strong support from the governor. Uh, we have legislation that was enacted in 2013, and that legislation is called the World's Best Workforce. This legislation ens ensures that every school district in the state has measurable goals in multiple domains, and those domains um, are developmental in nature. So they range from making sure that our students are ready for kindergarten, um, have, meet a third grade reading level, are um, college and career ready, and uh, that they actually meet our milestone of high school graduation. In addition, we have some strong collaborations, uh, and one of them, of course, is the Minnesota Alliance with Youth and Grad Minnesota, working with the Minnesota Department of Education, as well as the Regional Centers of Excellence. And these organizations are aligned um, in supporting the use of high-quality data, as well as using evidence-based practices to support our young people. Uh, Grad Minnesota 
um, is a statewide level initiative and uh, it actually supports the use of high quality data through its priority recommendations. One of its key recommendations is to improve graduation rates and close achievement gaps between student groups that exist in our state. And we have to use, do that using quality data. Awesome. And Cammy, can you, can you tell us a little bit about how MIRS was created, the state's data system? Sure. Um, before I came to work with the Minnesota Alliance with Youth, I actually worked with the Minnesota Department of Education for nine years. And during that time, MDE received a federal high school uh, graduation incentive grant. Um, MDE staff worked with high schools to develop and implement plans to prevent dropout and increase uh, school completion. And while we were um, involved with that grant, we came to know that uh, it was incredibly important to identify students early on, prior to high school, and provide the additional supports that were needed to facilitate uh, graduation. That became clear during that grant. And also at that time, lots of research was emerging about the importance of early warning systems through the work of Johns Hopkins, Jobs for the Pu Future, the Data Quality Campaign, the National High School Center, and more. Uh, and we paid a lot of attention to that research. So I like to say that MIRS was developed through sheer will um, with strong advocates um, working uh, to make this happen, hard work. We also had some funds from the State Longitudinal Data Grant. Um, and so now MIRS is currently available to all schools that serve students in grades six and nine, uh, but its use is not mandatory. Um, I just wanted to mention that right up front. Um, I also want to mention that it's not a perfect system, uh, but it definitely gets the conversation going. So, thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Cami. Um, I'd now love to bring John, Jackie, and Melanie into the discussion. Um, I'll direct this first just couple of questions to John. Um, John, can you tell us a little bit about um, what the MIR system actually looks like? Yeah, so here, um, when people run the report, it's a really pretty simple report. It's got three charts uh, with tables of aggregate data. And uh, first, there's a big picture piece of data for the state, district, and school, uh, which includes percentage of the students predicted at risk of not graduating. And then there are below um, are counts of students at risk, first by variables, um, which include like reading and math and multiple enrollments, uh, suspension, and attendance data. Um, and then there are count by students by um, students at risk by special population, which um, would be students identified as English learner, uh, free and reduced price lunch, special education, migrant, and, and homeless. Um, and that's um, the report. And then districts can uh, download a spreadsheet of individual student data. So this lists student names with these indicators um, of the variables and special populations um, next to the names and indicating which ones may be causes of each being uh, at risk. Um, and that way, with this kind of information, teams can sort these students into groups and, and prioritize and strategize ways of helping them. Awesome. And, and so what do the schools do with the MIRS data once they have access to it? I'm sure they do a lot of different things with it. What we uh, intend for them to do we, is a seven-step process that we have, and um, it's based on implementation and continuous improvement. So um, the seven steps kind of go like this. There's uh, step one would be uh, establishing a team um, that would focus on graduation and uh, this type of data. And then we, um, and all of these steps have tools in this implementation guide that we offer. Um, but in step two, we, we uh, suggest that they provide orientation um, to that team and to others who are using this data. It's really important to establish all of that and let people know what this data is and how to use it before they get to step three, which is actually to run the MIRS report and get that off of the, um, the website. Uh, people often want to jump right into data and uh, just start looking at it without any kind of orientation. So we, we, we suggest going through um, and require some training before even getting access to the data. So once they run the report, um, in step four, they, they review 
and interpret this data. We have lots of tools for that and suggestions on how to do that kind of um, uh, exploration. And that would be just the MIRS data itself. And then in step five, we have them dig deeper. And this is where you go into your local data. Um, our MIRS data doesn't have as much um, depth and breadth that we wish it that could, but we have um, visions of having it uh, better in the future. Um, but um, to supplement that, there, there's local data. Um, I think this is an area where um, schools and districts need even more uh, assistance in, in doing this, digging of, deeper into their data, but looking at root causes of, of, of problems that they see. And then um, once they establish some of that, then step six is where they then start prioritizing, selecting, implementing, and monitoring the different interventions to support the students. Um, and we really encourage them to um, make sure that those supports, once implemented, are really implemented as intended. Um, all students need to be served consistently, and we have a phrase that says uh, students can't really benefit by interventions they, can't actually, they don't actually receive. So we really need to make sure that we're, we're looking at how we're implementing these, these practices, um, or they, they, we can't say that they're effective at all. Um, and then step seven is to review and refine the whole seven-step process and making sure that uh, uh, we're really looking at whether these indicators are actually um, flagging the kids appropriately and how our, our local data is uh, you know, complementing the, the MIRS data. But it's really left up to the districts. Um, uh, on how they're going to, to deal with all these steps. Awesome. Thanks so much, John. And um, would love to hear a little bit from Jackie and Melanie. Um, can you all elaborate a little bit on how the state of, of Minnesota is, are supporting districts and schools in, in using the MIRS data effectively? Yes, um, I'd be happy to comment. Um, well, first of all, John and I have um, hosted orientation webinars um, from uh, this winter and fall, twice a month. Um, we try and have an AM and a PM and ha on various days of the week um, so that um, in order to gain access to the data, they need to attend this, this webinar. Um, and then we also, um, through the webinar, as John mentioned, we walk them through the implementation manual that outlines the seven steps that also includes um, resources uh, for whether it's to help them dig deeper into their data. Um, there are also resources that they can apply, um, you know, once they've figured out what their greatest need is to, to select an innovation to then implement. Um, Jackie, do you have some more to add? Yeah, sure. Um, and then another part that comes along with um, MIRS is that our schools and, and the people who have just received the training need to have access to the reports online. And because of um, data privacy concerns and um, just concerns of, of um, using this very um, sensitive data correctly, um, we, we don't allow access to this information um, Freely, so it's it's one person per school district that has access to the MIRS data, and um, we have several requirements where, um, like, the superintendent needs to sign an authorization form that the person that is requesting access has has permission from the superintendent, and then that person has to complete their online training, which Mel Melanie just spoke about. Um, so that's one, uh, you know, that's kind of a lot of um, administrative stuff that's happening behind the scenes. And um, then another thing that we're doing here at the Department of Education, um, our data analytics department is also kind of looking at the, the, um, the data. And um, so yes, we are, we're working with schools that have been designated um, priority schools, we call them here in Minnesota, and um, focus as well. Um, so. Um, our staff is working like really closely with those schools, but then there's a there's a bunch of schools just just out of um, just above those designated schools that um, have you know reason we have reasons to be concerned with their graduation rates as well, and they and we really feel strongly that um, they would benefit from this data and benefit from training, um, and so our analytics department has helped us kind of. Um, 
identify them and we're um, kind of getting geared up and ready to um, connect with them and provide them training as well. Um, we also have a, a NEARS web page and um, just all kinds of ways to support and access this data. So if you're, if you're curious about NEARS, you could Google NEARS, <laughs> M-E-I-R-S, uh, -E and Minnesota Department of Education, and you'll find our NEARS web page. Awesome. Thanks so much, Melanie and Jackie. Um, you know, just two more quick questions for this particular panel. I um, wonder if you all can talk a little bit about the challenges with the MIR system and um, what you believe the future of the system looks like in Minnesota. Okay, well, I'll, I'll start out there. Um, one of the challenges is that MIRS isn't really a real-time data system, so we, in October, have the schools upload all of their data that kind of feeds into the MIRS system. And then um, every February, that system uh, gets uploaded into the MIRS system and becomes available to the school. So already there's a few months lag right there. But then another concern that we have is that um, the, there's only, uh, this data is um, for students in sixth grade and ninth grade. Is that correct, Melanie? Sometimes I, yep. Yeah. Okay. So um, students in sixth and ninth grade are the ones who, um, who the reports are kind of the, um, the reports are addressing and so it's not all students in all school in in the district that are being um, you know flagged for their uh, for being at risk so that's one concern and then um, another concern is that um, you know this information is limited it doesn't include local data like uh, like uh, credits for instance um, so there's there's only those items that John had mentioned earlier that are um, included in this data and so we need to maybe perhaps work with schools and help them learn how to integrate their data into our MIRS system and um, use that information to um, benefit their students. Mm -hmm. And additionally, um, another challenge is really helping schools to be able to implement a strategy or innovation um, after they've looked at their MIRS data. Uh, right now, we um, have very limited resources in order to get people on the ground to support schools. Um, we just have our, our orientation webinar, so we're looking forward um, to the future. The Regional Centers of Excellence um, in working with ESSA, um, the Every Student Succeeds Act, and supporting more high schools, um, we're looking forward to having more boots on the ground there and being able to support high schools um, with how to digest this data, and then how to appropriately select an innovation and appropriately implement that innovation so that, you know, the, the intended response is, is, is the outcome. Um, we're also, in the future, um, our regional centers of excellence have a data day for each of the schools that are um, designated. And um, previously, we had just looked at our testing data and had schools incorporate their local data. Um, but this year, I'm also having them incorporate looking at the MIRS data, since many of the elementary schools that we support go through sixth grade, so that we can start getting them thinking about um, getting students on track already at that time. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Melanie. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, John and Cami. Really appreciate you all. Um, participating in uh, the discussion in this way. Um, we really just sincerely appreciate the opportunity to hear how your state has and will continue to prioritize the effective use of high quality data to make sure students are on track for success. Um, now I'd love to, um, to, to just kick off the Q&A portion of the webinar. Um, and if you haven't already, uh, just encouraging attendees uh, to please take a moment now to submit your questions via the questions panel. Um, and I'd love to just get us started with, with this question. High school graduation rates have been the source of a lot of news coverage and media skepticism. Many journalists and policy researchers have raised questions about the value of a high school diploma. I'd love to just ask any of our panelists to weigh in on this question. Um, 
what do you make of this skepticism and how can we ensure young people crossing the graduation stage are truly prepared for their next steps in life? Um, this is Jenny. I can start a little bit by talking about um, what we've seen in Chicago and um, on a certain level I do understand the skepticism about the value of a high school diploma because I think it's becoming increasingly clear that it's not sufficient for many um, jobs that could actually sustain a family. Um, on the other hand, we do have to start where, you know, if kids aren't graduating from high school, they're not going to be graduating from high school college ready, nor are they going to be going off to college. So it's a critical step in the process. Um, there's a lot of actually really encouraging news with what's happening um, in Chicago, because at the same time we've seen this dramatic increases in high school graduation rates, we're also seeing increases in students um, enrolling in four-year colleges, are seeing more students um, uh, taking AP classes. We're seeing more students um, get a, getting at least a three on an AP class. And probably most importantly, um, we are also seeing increases in ACT scores. So over the past um, 10, 15 years, you've actually seen the average ACT scores go up by two points at the same time that we're seeing thousands more students taking the ACT. So I think it's a really important thing where, yes, you know, high school graduation is maybe the first step, um, but working on high school graduation is not at all incompatible with really making sure that students are learning more and are graduating from high school college ready and being positioned and being in a position where they can be successful once they go to college. <laughs> This is Brennan. If I could build on that just a little bit too, there's um, a couple of things I want to hit on. And one is, um, you know, I mentioned as I was presenting that we think it's so important for states to, states, districts, really leaders at every level to help people understand what goes into the data. So when you're putting a graduation rate out, make sure that it's connected back to kids, that it's telling a story, that you're helping people understand, here's the decisions that we made in calculating this. Like, give people more context than just that number. It's such a success that grad rates are going up. What does that mean? What does that mean in your community? Um, and the other thing I'll say, I think building on Jenny's point about, you know, the successes are so much more in, um, than just the grad rate going up is this concept of stakeholder engagement that I think has been a huge conversation in education right now because it was a focus of the Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, and I always say it's too bad it takes a federal law to get to get leaders to think about how can we go out into the community and ask people what they think is important in education. And I think this is a topic where it's critically important to continue to go out. And I know that's not easy, um, but to continually go out and talk to people from all different communities about what is important, what do you think readiness looks like? You know, here's what our standards are. How are these meeting your needs? And just keep those conversations going. Awesome, thank you so much, Brandon, and thank you, Jenny. Um, a whole lot to, to sort of meditate on there and, and really helpful. Um, in grounding us in the, in the current context and the opportunity for high school graduation to be um, really seen as a part of the, the overall um, landscape and opportunity to make sure young people are, are prepared uh, to become thriving adults. Um, I think this next question uh, from Janet came up when you were speaking earlier, Jenny. Um, and Janet was wondering how you all in Chicago are factoring in the role of school principals, uh, which have become more of a priority in, in recent years. So when you think about that work, how have you all been um, considering the role of school principals? Yeah, I mean, school leadership is clearly really important. I'll talk a little bit actually about the work of the Network for College Success where, you know, I mean, so this is less about the research side of things. We, have, we do have evidence that, about the role that high school principals play and teacher leaders play in school improvement. But I think one of the really important of the work that the Network for College Success is doing, particularly with the 17 high schools that they're working more intensively with, is really um, working on this idea of building teacher or um, principal capacity to lead schools and be leading them and thinking about the, the role that data can play and really highlighting what matters. 
um, using research evidence to guide um, what their strategies might be and to be really focused on the problems that um, that matter for their schools and can really lead to improved student outcomes. So um, in the story of thinking about this data um, and, with, and really hoping to see changes in schools that have that principals are at the heart of it, and as well as developing teacher leaders who can also be guiding this work so that data and research evidence becomes infused in the school culture and is really guiding the work that teachers are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, and this next question, um, John, is, is directed um, to you. And um, the attendee is wondering, you know, how schools in the Twin Cities are addressing the needs of high percentages of immigrant youth um, in, in um, the Meyer system and, and the data work that you all are doing? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and I'm not sure I have uh, great information about what kind of strategies they're using. Um, you know, I know they use some of the data um, from our MIRS system that might flag some of these kids. And, and you know, we find that sometimes some of the data that um, is available uh, through the MIRS system in some situations um, isn't really giving the district new information. You know, it's like, oh, we already knew that about these kids, especially if it's a small school or something like that. Or, um, and at, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I can answer your question about what they, what particular things they might be doing um, for that specific group. I don't know mm -hmm. if any of my other um, folks from Minnesota have seen. Melanie, do you, do you have any information about what some districts might be doing? Melanie might be on mute. Anything you want to add there, Melanie? Okay. <laughs> Melanie, did you I, want to I weigh really in? I think you might be on mute. Yep, I will oh, weigh in. Um, I, I don't <laughs> have any specifics to add either. Just because we're on the, unfortunately, on just the side of providing, here are some strategies to use, and we're not really boots on the mm -hmm. ground. Um, that is one of the biggest and greatest challenges of our situation right now. So I wish I had some information. Cami, would you have any um, any ideas either? Uh, this is Cami, and one of the things that I was thinking of uh, when you're talking about that is that uh, the MIR system actually does group data so that uh, it yep. looks at our um, English learner population, which in and of itself I think is really important in terms of an accountability piece. Um, as far as the strategies go, and I think you were talking specifically about the Twin Cities. Um, we, we do actually have um, several strategies that are being used in Minneapolis um, in terms of providing uh, global education. Uh, that comes to mind in terms of our Minneapolis um, school district right now because that is such a critical issue and we do have so, uh, such high percentages of students uh, who are immigrant uh, in, the, in that particular school, as well as in the St. Paul schools. Um, I would encourage you to go to the Minneapolis website and look up global education. Um, I do know that there is also a strong focus on, uh, going back to the, to the um, conversation before, not just high school graduation, but preparation for going on beyond high school. And I know that there are a lot of efforts in um, Minneapolis and St. Paul that actually um, help students to navigate uh, systems post-secondary uh, so that they can have success in those systems as well, um, including um, access to some of our early middle college programs um, and uh, post-secondary options. Awesome. Thanks, Cami, and um, thank you all so much. Uh, Team Minnesota. Um, this next question I think anyone can weigh in on um, and um, Indra is wondering if, if anyone can share a bit about the use of social media, traditional media, and community outreach to raise awareness um, and motivate communities to become more involved as advocates, ambassadors, and partners as we work to improve uh, data quality use, quality data use. 
This is Cami again. Um, I can speak to that, uh, especially through the work of Grad Minnesota. One of the things that we try to do is we try to put a face to the numbers that uh, we're providing, but um, a, a lot of the work with respect to um, Grad Minnesota uh, has started by just building awareness with respect to the disparities in our graduation rates within our state um, because we have an aggregate rate that's, a pro that's about 82 percent, which is really good. Um, needs to be better. We want 90 percent by 2020, but um, that rate does not reflect some of our graduation rates that go as low as uh, 60 percent for some of our student groups. Um, so I think a big part of it is getting um, that information out um, in a user-friendly way through blogs, through storytelling, through um, tweets and posts, uh, that kind of thing, um, as well as um, uh, moving it forward um, with, as I said before, specific stories about these students uh, who uh, who are facing multiple challenges and struggles and yet being successful. Um, so I think that social media is super important in terms of getting that story across. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much, Cami. Um, I was hoping you'd weigh in there <laughs> with the grant medicine <laughs> perspective. <laughs> Um, great. Well, we'll make this last this question to Jenny our last question before um, just giving you guys links to some good websites to to access more information. Um, but Jenny, one of the uh, Julie who's on the, the the webinar today is wondering when you mentioned uh, that on track freshmen should not fail more than one semester in a core class, whether that is referring to the block schedule or year long classes, or or is it both? Um. So when we developed the on-track indicator, it was is just um, so it's not for block scheduling, and it's just one um, failure per semester. So, um, so it's both. I mean, so part of it is just a you know it's a way of being of identifying which students are struggling. I think if you were trying to think about a freshman on-track indicator for a school or a district that's using block scheduling, you'd probably want to you know look look a little bit at the relationships and all that, but I think part of also what um, the on-track indicators came up to is the student experience of failure because one of the things, and then how that can be really difficult for a student who is starting high school trying to figure out if they belong, if they're actually capable to be successful in the high school setting, even if they had to be successful in eighth grade. So I think in some ways, that experience of failure, even if it's just one, um, can also be mm. an important indicator regardless of the actual structure of classes. Awesome. Well, well, thank you so much, Jenny, for addressing that question. Thank you again to Brennan, uh, to Cami, to John, Melanie, and Jackie. Um, that is all the time we have today, and I just want to appreciate everyone who uh, took the time to tune in with us for this conversation on high-quality data and the important role it plays in helping us make sure our students are on track for success. Uh, for more information about the Grad Nation campaign, would encourage you to visit our website um, at uh, gradnation.americaspromise.org. Um, and to access tools and resources that were mentioned throughout the webinar, you can also visit the To and Through Project um, on the University of Chicago's website, the Minnesota Alliance with Youth's website, um, and also uh, this page, which is a reference here um, on the Minnesota Department of Education's website. I want to encourage you to continue the conversation via social media by using the hashtag GradNation. Uh, we appreciate you for joining us and hope you'll take a few minutes after the webinar to answer a few questions in the short survey that follows. We look forward to continuing to support your efforts to improve graduation rates and outcomes for young people. Thank you so much. <laughs>